Welcome to On Risk, Rapid Legal Lessons for Policyholders, KNL Gates podcast that discusses insurance topics from a policyholder's perspective. My name is Jeff Maher, and I'm a partner in the Insurance Recovery and Counseling Practice Group here at KNL Gates. Joining me today from London is Sarah Turpin, who's the co leader of our practice group. Thanks for joining us today, Sarah. Thanks, Jeff. Happy to be here. Now, in our prior episode of the On Risk podcast, we spoke to Carolyn Brandt Hoover about COVID-related insurance claims in the United States. And today we're going to be talking to Sarah about COVID-related insurance claims in the United Kingdom. But before we do, and as background for our listeners, I just wanted to explain why Sarah is an excellent person to talk to about this topic. Number one, she's been following this topic from the very beginning of the pandemic. She has written several articles about the subject, including a recent article about the very important UK Supreme Court decision that we'll be talking to her about in a little bit. And she has several active claims for clients against insurance companies that are in various stages of development. So with that as background, Sarah, I want to start by asking you the same question I asked Carolyn at the beginning of our last podcast, which is to help orient our listeners. What type of of insurance policies are we talking about? What type of claims are we talking about when we say COVID-related insurance claims? So the majority of claims we've been dealing with in London are claims by commercial policyholders under either event cancellation or property damage and business interruption insurance policies. As you may know, event cancellation insurance is a specialist form of insurance cover specifically designed for businesses which host and manage exhibitions and events, whether that's a sporting event or an education or industry event. Event cancellation differs from many other forms of insurance in that the cover for business interruption losses is not dependent on the existence of physical loss or damage. Broadly speaking, event cancellation insurance is designed to cover losses arising from the cancellation, postponement or curtailment of an insured event for reasons which are beyond the insured's control. For most commercial policyholders, however, the cover which has been the main focus for COVID-19 related insurance claims is property damage and business interruption insurance, which we've seen relied upon in a much wider variety of business contexts. So we've got event cancellation, we've got property damage, business interruption type claims. How has the law developed? What are the key coverage issues that are being litigated in the UK? So, as in the US, most commercial property and business interruption policies provide cover where the business interruption results from physical loss or damage to the insured business premises. This means that a key coverage issue from the outset has therefore been the ability of policyholders to claim physical loss or damage through the presence of COVID-19. The English High Court has considered one case, TKC London versus Alliance, in which the claimant, which was a cafe in London, argued that the temporary loss of use of its premises as a result of the nationwide lockdown imposed by the UK government was sufficient to trigger its insurance cover. The key issue was whether the enforced closure and loss of use of the cafe constituted physical loss of property. In what was a disappointing result for the policyholder, The court agreed with the insurer that the temporary loss of use of the premises was not sufficient to amount to physical loss for the purpose of the insurance cover. It's fair to say, however, in the UK that most business interruption claims have been advanced under the extensions of cover provided for non-damage related business interruption losses. There are two particular coverage extensions which most often come into play, which are commonly known as notifiable disease and denial of access extensions, although, of course, the name and the wording of these extensions varies enormously. Generally speaking, notifiable disease clauses provide cover where business is interrupted as a result of an occurrence of disease within the vicinity or within a specified distance of the insured premises. Denial of access clauses, however, provide cover where access to or use of the insured premises is hindered or denied as a result of danger or disturbance, typically as a consequence of actions or restrictions imposed by local or government authorities. The availability of cover under these non-damage extensions will ultimately depend on the construction of the wording in question. However, there has been some guidance from the English Supreme Court as a result of a test case brought by the Financial Conduct Authority, which regulates the conduct of insurers in the UK. 
Now, I'm very interested by this test case because this is a interesting development for me. What prompted the test case? Is it unusual for a test case like this to proceed in the UK? Give me some background on how this this happened. Yes, I mean, it's it's very unusual. It's it's certainly unprecedented for the Financial Conduct Authority to bring this sort of test case in the insurance context. But in this particular instance, it was it was prompted primarily by the 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 extent of the concern being expressed by policyholders regarding the grounds on which some insurers were seeking to deny insurance cover. And so the aim of the test case brought by the FCA was to try and resolve certain contractual uncertainties relating to these notifiable disease and denial of access clauses, and also what were what became known as hybrid clauses, which essentially involved a combination of both types of clause. So the test case was brought on the basis of 21 sample policy wordings, which had been issued to small and medium businesses in the UK by eight different insurers. The FCA acknowledged from the outset that the test case would not encompass all possible disputes, but its aim was to try and resolve some contractual and key causation issues involving these types of wording. So we have this very interesting and unusual test case in front of the Supreme Court that is supposed to provide guidance for policyholders and insurers. How did the Supreme Court rule? What did they say? So in the case of disease clauses, the Supreme Court concluded that these types of clause are properly interpreted as providing cover for business interruption losses caused by any cases of COVID-19 that occur within the relevant radius of the insured premises. Critically, however, the cover is not confined to business interruption losses, which result only from cases of a notifiable disease within the radius, as opposed to other cases elsewhere. Supreme Court found that as a matter of causation, government restrictions were imposed in response to all cases of COVID-19 within the UK as a whole, such that it's sufficient for the policyholder to show that there was at least one case of COVID-19 within the relevant policy area at the time that the restrictions were imposed. In terms of denial of access and hybrid clauses, the Supreme Court concluded that such clauses were triggered more readily than the court at first instance. In particular, the court found that there was no requirement for an actual legislative measure ordering closure, provided directions are given in mandatory terms, meaning cover could be triggered by the Prime Minister's instructions for businesses to close before the regulations imposing these restrictions were formally introduced. Also, that such clauses could be triggered where there is an inability to use or gain access to the insured premises for a particular activity. For example, a restaurant which could continue its takeaway business but was not able to use a, its sit-in dining business. Another point of interest, which has probably received rather less attention, is the approach taken by the Supreme Court in relation to a pollution and contamination exclusion relied upon by one particular insurer. The insurer argued that the effect of the exclusion was that any occurrence of notifiable disease was excluded from cover if that disease amounted to an epidemic. However, the Supreme Court saw no merit in this argument, not least because there was an obvious inconsistency between the cover provided by the policy for notifiable disease and the reference in the exclusion to disease and epidemic. The court determined that the reasonable reader would naturally assume that if this type of exclusion had been intended to restrict the cover for notifiable disease, this would have been done transparently as part of the extension and not buried away in the middle of a general exclusion at the back of the policy. What's particularly noteworthy about this and the approach taken by the Supreme Court as a whole is that the court was not willing to be confined by the more literal interpretation of the wording, which is so often relied upon by the insurers. The Supreme Court adopted the objective approach to policy construction promoted by English legal authorities, taking particular account of how the wording would be understood by the reasonable policyholder, in this case, recognising that they were dealing with standard form policies sold to small and medium businesses. So overall, sounds like a very favourable decision for policyholders, but it's a test case. And so it doesn't doesn't apply directly, I assume, to every policyholder, to every uh, policy. So how, how does this decision affect policyholders going forward? 
So yes, you're absolutely right. The Supreme Court judgment is very positive news to policyholders. The High Court judgment was favourable, but the Supreme Court in pre policyholders position even further, particularly as it adopted a much broader interpretation of the key terms in denial of access and hybrid clauses. The Supreme Court's findings on causation and in relation to so-called trends clauses also make it very challenging for insurers to deny or reduce cover for pandemic-related losses on the basis that losses were caused by other insured perils or other trends impacting the business. So while the test case focused on the wording of 21 sample policies, the Financial Conduct Authority has estimated that approximately 370,000 policyholders will be affected by the outcome. And so while the test case focused really on business interruption cover for small and medium businesses, there are a number of aspects of the judgment that are likely to be relevant to other insureds. The FCA has also suggested that the judgment will be of assistance to policyholders with different policies, such as event cancellation and landlord insurance, some of which contain similar clauses. Now, you say this case dealt with 21 sample policies, the wording in those 21 sample policies. Are there other clauses that maybe weren't considered by the Supreme Court that insurers are relying on to either deny coverage or issue reservations of rights? So, yes, one of the things that was highlighted by the test case was the wide variety of different types of clause which are in use within the London market. Just by way of example, some notifiable disease extensions specify a list of named diseases for which the cover will respond. And in one recent case, known as Rockcliffe Hall versus Travellers Insurance, the insured's extension specified 34 such diseases. And of course, COVID-19 was not included on that list. And the policyholder in that case argued that while several of the listed diseases were caused by specific pathogens, others were described in much more general terms, such as food or drink poisoning or plague. And as a result, the policyholder argued that the list was non-exhaustive and the general diseases should be given a broader interpretation. So, for example, the the policyholder said that plague should be read as a general term for infectious disease with a high mortality rate, including an epidemic or pandemic. Unfortunately for the policyholder, on that occasion, the court would not accept this broader interpretation. And in striking out the claim, the judge noted that this was one interpretation that no remotely reasonable reader would arrive at. So that case does demonstrate some of the potential difficulties policyholders may encounter with with named disease clauses, although ultimately, of course, the outcome will depend on the specific wording of the particular clause. So if I'm a policyholder with a a COVID-related loss and I'm thinking about pursuing coverage or thinking about pursuing a claim, what are some of the things I should be thinking about right now? So policyholders wishing to pursue claims do need to be mindful of any time period periods imposed by the policy in terms of the submission of claims information or or proof of loss. The FCA has confirmed that insurers can't include the period between 17th of June 2020 when the FCA commenced the test case and its final resolution on the 15th of January 2021 when the Supreme Court handed down its judgment when relying on applicable time limits. However, obviously, now that the test case has come to a close, policyholders need to be acting promptly in collating and providing relevant documentation to support their claim. Policyholders also need to think about whether any additional evidence is required to prove the presence of COVID-19, whether that's at the premises or within the relevant area stipulated by the policy. And the FCA has published some guidance to assist with this process, along with a, a COVID-19 calculator, which is designed to assist policyholders in proving the presence of COVID-19. Obviously, any policyholders who are facing a, a long drawn out and an uphill battle with insurers may end up having to pursue claims through a formal dispute resolution process, in which case they will need to keep in mind any potential limitation periods. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you for listening to this episode of On Risk. I hope you found our discussion helpful. To find more insurance-related content, visit the KL Gates Hub at www.klgates.com slash hub. The Hub is a digital destination for timely insight on critical issues, 
at the intersection of business and law, where lawyers can also earn CLE credit. You can also visit www.klgates.com to learn more about our insurance recovery and counseling practice group or to connect with one of our lawyers. Thanks again for listening, and please be on the lookout for the next episode of On Risk.